I didn't craft my journey. You didn't my journey, craft. no. I believe in multiple lives mm -hmm. and you get to choose what you're going to be in and choose what you're going to have to deal with. But when you get here, you forget it all. And my journey was crafted beforehand. Digital Audio Health by Cymatrax. Like to welcome to the show Jan Burrell, stroke thriver and children's author. Welcome to the show, Jan. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Can you let the audience know what your life was like before your stroke? Well, depending on how early you want to go, um, right before the stroke, I was a farmer, a vegetable farmer. Mm -hmm. And also a baker. We were going to six farmers markets a week. Wow. I was baking 90 loaves of bread and rolls and sweet rolls for breakfast and cookies and bake um, scones and things like that. On top of doing the weeding for the farm in the morning, I'd get up at four o'clock. Mm. Here's a typical day. Get up at four, go outside with my dog and weed for an hour. Then at five o'clock, I would start to harvest what we needed for the day. By six o'clock, I was back in the house and usually for two of our markets, loading up the trailer, get ready to go to the market. Mm -hmm. If we had a later market, I'd be baking more things for either that day or the next day. Things like my English muffin bread and cookies, of course. Then we'd get to the market, unload put it all out for the folks that would come to visit. We had the most amazing customers, great people. We even had, he was an Olympian that is now a she. Mm -hmm. Bruce Jenner come through. We had people like that in our farmer's market down in Keene Valley, just outside of Lake Placid. Oh, nice. Yeah. And then at the end of the, the uh, farmer's market, we'd pack up everything into the truck, go home, unload the trailer again in the truck and put everything out. If any vegetables were left, we would cycle them in for the animals and put all new fresh for the next day. And then I would start baking. And I get done baking usually at one or two o'clock in the morning. And mm. then my day started out again at four, regardless. Mm. So in a way, the stroke was my own fault because I didn't say no to doing too much. I was also a substitute floor teacher. I was there every single day at the school and I loved the kids. Oh my God, they were awesome. Mm -hmm. So I was walking into the apartment one morning to start. We, we have an apartment attached to my house. We used it as our vegetable storage so that the critters wouldn't get all the vegetables. Mm -hmm. And I felt on the floor. I knew I was having a stroke because half of my side wouldn't work. I called my partner, my then partner. I called my son and I called 911. And by the time I got to 911, I couldn't talk. But they got somebody to me very quickly because at least I had the phone. But at that point, I had the most amazing thing happen. I got to go for a helicopter ride wow. from below New York over to Burlington. And I've always, always wanted to go on a helicopter ride, except mm. I don't remember it. Yeah. Go figure. <laughs> yes. So I was out for three days. When I came to, um, they told me I had been responding to them, although I don't know anything for the three days, but responding in eye blinks. And my left hand movement. My daughter was there. She'd flown in from Colorado. My son was there. He was helping my partner with the farmer's markets. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't speak. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. I couldn't talk. Uh, well, that's speaking. I couldn't move my right side at all. 
and was wondering how long this was going to last. I started being able to speak. The aphasia is still something that bothers me, especially when I'm very tired. Mm -hmm. Oh, my perception of things was way off too. When I could get words out, if they were showing me a picture of, say, like a tree, I'd look at it. I'd think tree, but I'd say something like banana. Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult. People, I would mix up names. My my poor partner at that time, I kept calling him Tracy, which was my ex-husband's name. <laughs> he was a good egg through it all. And when they released me six weeks later from rehab, I could kind of maneuver myself around with a quad cane or a hemi, actually a hemi walker, which is half of the size of a regular walker, mm -hmm. but only go about 50, 60 feet. And then that was it. I was done. So I sat in a lifter chair. My dad had had a lifter chair, so we put it in here. I could get up and down that way. And I slept in the chair because I could get out of it. I was in a wheelchair most often. We had reworked parts of the house, widened doorways. I had all sorts of adaptive equipment to help me with things like going to the bathroom because while I was in rehab, I am a very stubborn person, and I wanted to do it all by myself, including going to the bathroom. I mean, it's something that you usually do in private. And after the second time of falling off of the toilet, hmm. I decided I'd better get help. So, hmm. so I had the adaptive equipment for that. I still have a chair to get into my shower, but it's the most amazing thing when you go from sitting to standing and are able to move around and feel that water on your back mm -hmm. is such a pleasure. Yes. Can you take us back again before the stroke? Like, did you have any headaches or any symptoms at all that was cautioning you that you should slow down? That's yes, I did. I had headaches for about two years beforehand and constant dizziness. Dizziness? And, what type of yeah. dizziness? Like a vertigo. Like a vertigo, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd be walking along, get dizzy. I'd put my head down and just power through it and do my stuff still being dizzy and not paying attention to it. And I really should have. Although you don't think about things like that. What I had remembered after the stroke, back when I was in high school, I had to have surgery on a foot and they had problems because they found out my veins were very brittle. Hmm. When they had gone in to work on my foot, just moving things around, they had broken blood vessels and my whole foot turned black and blue and swelled up. And they said, whatever you do when you're growing up, don't smoke. Don't take birth control and keep your blood pressure down. Well, mm -hmm. I never did the first two. My blood pressure was always high. And especially at this time, trying to get everything done, not sleeping. It was a, a mix for disaster. But, but it was the most amazing thing to happen to me because I finally realized I had to stop living my life for everybody else. I am the product of child abuse, which gave me some of the most beautiful experiences in my life. Because when I was 10 or 11, we had a camp in the Adirondacks outside of Old Forge. It was just an old trailer chained to a tree so it wouldn't roll down the hill. But we were up there all summer. My mother and I during the week and my father would come on weekends. He worked in IBM. And she was so drunk that I could take off with my little dog Toto and be gone two or three days and she never missed me. And during that time, I met an elderly Native American who also liked to walk around the mountains and just not take any paths, just enjoy and he taught me how to track, he taught me how to forage, and he taught me my love for poetry. 
through Robert Frost and William Wordsworth and amazing poets like that. So that's the time when I started writing my poetry. And it stayed with me my whole life. So God, again, he does things for a reason. And I never would have had this serene love of the mountains if it weren't for my mother. And she was fighting her own demons and she lost the fight and gave in. So I don't necessarily blame her because it was something that was also in the family. And I'm adopted, so I broke the tradition, which is a good mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So, but after the stroke, a year after, I was walking better with my quad cane, which has four pieces on the bottom. Yes, I still use it because if I use a regular cane, I'm always stopping and putting it down to do things because I only have the one hand. It always falls to the ground. At least a quad cane stays standing, so I use it still. But I went back to school. I still couldn't speak well. The administration didn't know this. I couldn't read. Mm. And a substitute teacher has to read the teacher's instructions for the day. But the kids, I'd known the kids since kindergarten. And... I was doing junior high and senior high because it was a le one level building, didn't have two floors. So they said that would be good for me instead of the elementary. And the kids would find me every day because I was all over the school and they would write the instructions on the board for me. And they would come in on their periods off and help me with classes even. And on my periods off, oh God forbid, they would come in and make me walk around the halls. And then we would go back to the classroom and they would talk to me and wait or finish my sentences and keep moving on. But I was so tired by the end of the day when I got home, I couldn't talk anymore. Mm -hmm. But because of them, I mean, when they were reading the assignments, they all made a plan to read out loud. They knew I couldn't read. And they made sure I was following along. So between that and the children's books that I started reading, first board books with pictures and a word under it, to first and second level, up to mid-grade, and then finally up to Christopher Paolini, who wrote um, the Aragon series mm -hmm. with dragons. Um, those kids helped me learn and kept pushing me. They didn't listen to the doctors who said, you're going to only get back up to one year. The brain doesn't work past then. So what you don't have, you're going to continue to not have. This mm -hmm. was before, before neuroplasticity yes. became more well-known. But doctors are still saying that you have your, mo your biggest growth of recovery during that first year. And after that, it becomes negligible. But I went back to college. I got my master's degree during COVID when I was laid off. If what they said were true, none of that would have been possible. Mm -hmm. I'm an assistant associate drag um, editor of a uh, ezine online. Mm -hmm. It's one that's out of of all places, Israel. So we kind of went on sabbatical while the strife was happening but i help with the editing with that i've written a scientific paper with several other authors for the brain institute of america um and lately i actually went back to class um starting in january to become a coach to help people that have had strokes that have had traumatic brain injuries because stroke falls under that category. So I wanna help those individuals, their caretakers and their loved ones because it's very hard for the person with a traumatic brain injury to communicate. I am part of a poetry club where we get together and we write poems mm -hmm. and we read them to each other. And aphasia and all, you can tell that 
they are all getting better because the more we do this, the more we speak and interact with people, the better we get. But at first you get so mad because you don't know how to communicate to them and tell them what you want, what you need, because your words aren't right or they're not there or you can't think of them. Mm -hmm. So I want to be able to work with them, let them know there is hope after a year that they can do it. Because if I could, they could. And I'm almost 60 now. I had the stroke when I was 50, right before my 51st birthday. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, yeah. when you say brain injuries are pretty close to stroke, what type of brain injuries, like traumatic brain injuries or yes. a fall and you hit your head and have to get stitches? Or is it more car accidents and falls? Actually, it's anything that can be traumatic to the brain. Traumatic usually being a blood, either a blood clot, which usually can be reversed rather quickly, mm -hmm. or a hemorrhage, which I had, where okay. you have bleeding in the brain. Any time that blood hits the tissue of the brain, it kills it. Oh, So my stroke, the hemorrhagic, what the bleed was close to the center of my brain and it wiped out everything. The doctor said I lost all my prime real estate. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a farmer. If you have bad land, you fix it. So I figured if I mix my desert with my swamp land, eventually when it, it'll turn into fertile land. So I kept mixing. That's a good analogy. Yeah. Now, the brain injury open you up to more sensitivity about energies or different things that you didn't have before the stroke? I've always been an empath. Empath? Yeah. And I've always been able to, okay, the best way I can explain it, mm -hmm. all my life, I have felt people's energy. Mm -hmm. And the ones that I am drawn to are ones that are going to attempt suicide because I tried to do that when I was a teen. Mm -hmm. So I can feel them and I go over to them and I've done this well till the stroke. If I see them sitting there and they're all encased in black, I say, whatever it is, just remember, it's going to be better tomorrow. I promise. And then I walk away. When you say encased in black, what does that mean? Do you mean the air around them, the energy around them is black? It's shaded, but I guess it would be an aura. Oh, an aura, right. Okay. I can't see colors in auras. I can see usually a white around a person. Mm -hmm. But with them, it's so dark. It's not the clothing. It's just, yes, they're I dark. I understand. And so did you find that your empathic abilities increased after the stroke? I've been taking classes. I love this. I'm always learning new stuff Good. with Oliver Nino and his wife, Mandy Morris. Mm -hmm. And apparently all of us are born with some special abilities. We just block it out because we don't understand it when we're little. Or somebody says, oh, that's not real. Like yeah. you're talking to an imaginary friend. Yes. But yet you can see that Im imaginary friend. I had one and I found out it was me. I had gone back to protect myself as a little girl. Mm -hmm. And that actually helped me love myself because I realized I had all this time. But we turn it off, all our abilities. Mm -hmm. So in a way, yes, it did strengthen it because... It shut off my drive to do everything else so I could focus more on me and what was going on inside my head. Mm -hmm. I'm learning how to quiet my brain so I can listen to myself too. I never I never heard myself. I, I guess I did. I channel. But that's not me. That's something else coming through. Mm -hmm. A lot of my poetry is from channeling. And okay. seeing things that are just so beautiful, so unusual. So when you say channeling, 
does it feel like something around you has opened up to you and words come that you're able to write down? What does it feel like? Actually, it feels like I'm just sitting in my body, letting it be used for a higher good. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of sit there and watch and I realize I'm talking. It, it's my voice. It doesn't change. Yes. But I have no idea where the words are coming from other than one of my spirit guides, probably. Mm -hmm. who sees something that I don't understand, but he, he or she does. And mm -hmm. it's, it's actually a beautiful experience. Yes. And can you turn it on and, or turn it off? Or is it just, you feel like you're in an altered state and then it just comes to you? The second. Yeah. I haven't learned how to turn it on and turn it off. Yes. Yes, <laughs> they they usually just come when I need them or when someone around me needs them. Mm, beautiful. Mm -hmm. And do you feel that you have any other abilities that you didn't have or they increased after the stroke? Actually, my channeling has mm -hmm. been pretty quiet lately, but my empathic abilities have definitely gotten stronger because I'm, like I said, calmer and able to sit back and relax and let them flow. Mm -hmm. Whereas I was always pushing them down before because there was too much to do. You're too busy. Yeah. Right. And uh, sometimes, you know, what I've learned, I learned it was myself and I learned speaking with other people and interviewing people is that usually people are running full steam ahead and they're not listening to the whispers. They're not listening to those ideas that come across the screen of their mind that is warning them that they may be in danger, right? Warning them to slow down, popping another Tylenol or Advil when you have a headache instead of resting or drinking more because we're so dehydrated all the time, mostly is what's wrong. And when they end up with an accident, mine was a T-bone. I was T-boned at 55 miles an hour and did not have a scratch on me. And it was my soul's duty to get my attention the best way it could, or she or he could, to realign me in my life's walk, right, is the best way I can put it. Because I was running pretty hard, I was working, and I was going from appointment to appointment. And I was just not paying attention. And when I was stopped in my tracks like that, I had to pay attention because it slowed me right down. I couldn't, I was mostly in bed for two weeks just from the trauma of it. it although I wasn't injured, I mean, I had it was banged around in my vehicle. I hit my head on my, on my seat rest. But what happened is that the abilities that I'd always had from a child and when you tell adults, they say, oh, you're just, you know, just as you said, you know, it's make believe or I don't believe in that or whatever. And they all came back, but they came back to me, I'd like to say tenfold. So I was able to know more. And because of that, be more. And that's when I started to write my book. So I find it's interesting that, you know, you also with your stroke injury, we're sort of led on that path of expansiveness of our abilities that we came here with, right? And so I just find it really, really interesting that when it comes right down to it, we're all the same injuries and allowing us to step into being an enlightened person and help others with that. I had to leave God first, though. In the beginning, mm -hmm. when I was going through all this, I hit depression very mm -hmm. hard and trying to get over that. That's something every stroke patient or traumatic brain injury person has to go through. And I say have to because they have to realign their bodies. They have to realign their purpose, everything. And a lot of people don't want to let go. Yeah. But I went through that. And then I guess God said enough, you know, shake yourself out, get going. There is a better day coming. This is for a reason. And then I just 
that's when I went back to school with the kids and they lifted my spirits. Um, although during that time, another problem with brain injury, when it comes back, when your feeling starts to come back, it's pain, which made me think maybe that's why newborns cry so much because the first sensations you get when touching something is pain. Mm. But anyway, that was just a, a pondering of mine. Mm -hmm. But the pain you get after a stroke is usually on the seven or eight out of 10 scale going up to nine at times. So I became, as you said, popping pills, I became addicted to um, a leave, I would take eight leave a day and about 12 Tylenol, mm. all at the same time. I mean, during the day, but mm -hmm. that was to function. So I could be there for the kids. So when I look back at all my experiences, I've felt them all and I had to have them all so that I can approach people that are dealing with this stuff and not tell them, oh, yes, I've been through that. I know how you feel that that's not the idea, but I can understand where they're coming from and yeah, I can help an them to find themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is an, an understanding for sure. And I think that with recovery I think that there is sort of like a surrendering to that recovery. Do, do you feel that? Very much so. And I also realize that that is something that some people can't get to on their own because they're not listening to their body. They're not. But lots of times we don't listen to, like we spend a whole lifetime not listening to our bodies. And then when we get stopped in our tracks, it's, we have to spend time healing and in that time healing, become hypersensitive to the feelings in our body. And if we can keep that, that's where the gifts come from. Like you're a writer, you know, your gifts have not exploded, but they've really come to a high level based on what you've went through. Would you agree with that? Very much so. Mm -hmm. And I have my diary from my whole journey of stroke, but there are still things that I am finding out about myself and mm -hmm. about my past and about my abilities. Like this book, Tippy's New Friend. Yes. There's a dragon. You can see it. Yes. Is a dream that I was given. And okay. in that dream, I got to ride a white dragon, but she was showing me that I was free. Mm -hmm. I wasn't chained to the ground. And although I am different now, as people look at me walking or with my aphasia, I put myself outside of the world, but yet I can find acceptance because of who I am and what I'm working through. So in my book, Tippy's New Friend, it's a lonely white dragon that finds friendship with my dog, Tippy, mm -hmm. and a person by the name of Lana, who is a high school teacher. And through that, we're going to go through, it's a series that deals with traveling, where you're going. It shows you maps so you can draw it in. Mm -hmm. And we're going to study the states and different countries and during this time, she's going to become a known dragon. She's not hiding anymore. She's come out and she's loving what she's finding. Mm -hmm. Beautiful analogy. And it actually does say in the book as well that Lana has had a stroke. So mm -hmm. further into the series, she's going to pick up a child. We're, I'm taking names of children across the our country yes and i went to get into countries too that these are real children i just use first name and they show us around the state so i'm going to find a handicapped from stroke child because stroke does not discriminate with age mm -hmm. people have had strokes amazingly even before they were born Mm -hmm. And I thought that was crazy. But when they come out, they have disabilities 
And when it's traced back, they can tell that something happened in the brain during in um, in the womb. And yes. I've heard of that. They stroke in utero. In utero. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. You're listening to the Rhonda Grant Show right now, whose podcast has been treated with digital audio health by my sponsor, Cymatrex. And today I have the great pleasure of interviewing Jan Burrell, who's just filling us with a lot of wisdom about her stroke that she had. Jan, let the audience know how they may reach out to you. I am on Facebook. All the um, links will be down below. I am on LinkedIn. I have my own personal website. If you can't, well, if you're interested, it's Thundercrest Books. Mm. And the name of my coaching is going to be Thundercrest Coaching for Stroke and Traumatic Brain Injury Individuals. So that's a name that's true to my heart. It was the name of my, my farm. Okay. And before that, it was the name of my sheep. I used to be a sheep farmer, and I was Thundercrest Hampshires. So oh. the name has been with me since the 90s. Since the 90s. Wonderful. Yeah. It's a great way to brand when you're doing so- that, for sure. Yes, it is. Yes. Do you feel that you've crafted your journey, were called, or a bit of both? I didn't craft my journey. You didn't my craft journey. It. No, I believe in multiple lives Mm -hmm. and you get to choose what you're going to be in and choose what you're going to have to deal with. But when you get here, you forget it all. And my journey was crafted beforehand and I am learning so many aspects of life. And it has been a journey that I wouldn't change anything of just because at this point, I have always wanted to help people. I am learning how to both spiritually and Mm -hmm. figuratively help people across the world. And that is an amazing thing. Basically, Mm -hmm. children of alcoholics grow up to be one of two things, Mm -hmm. either like that, which they hate, the alcoholic, Mm -hmm. or out to save the world. I had settled on my little corner, but now I I can help the world. Oh, yes. Yes. And how may people purchase your book? Is that on Amazon? Yes, it is. It's in Barnes and Noble. Great. And by the way, um, I am J.S. Burrell. That's my pseudonym. (laughs) Wonderful. What extraordinary discovery have you found in your life, Jan? That even though you occasionally leave the path, the great divine God or whoever you want to say, doesn't let you go. You're never alone. And when you take the time and get back on the path, they're there Mm -hmm. welcoming you back with open arms. Mm -hmm. And when you say you're never alone, what does that mean? You have your guides with you. Your guides. Guides or angels or beings, Mm -hmm. anything, or even you from a past life, that part of your spirit from a past life that follows along and gives you memories occasionally of things that happened. I'm writing a historical romance with a twist because it deals with these two people and goes back in time in all the times that they've met, how they met, whether they were male or female. There is one point where the lead character is a crusader who lost his love early in life. Mm-hmm. And it's it's kind of fun, but most of these lives are things that I remember. I know that sounds odd, mm-hmm. but... No, but there is talk now that people can remember why they've came here. And sometimes through, like, we begin a remembering of what our soul's mission is or what our mission is on this time around, right? And then also being able to remember some of past lives through hypnosis or some other type of recollection. What do you say to that? I believe in it because my way of delving into my past is to start writing and it comes out and it's all, it's not something I think about. I just write. Mm -hmm. It's kind of neat. Yes. It's interesting. The brain 
or something above the brain (laughs) is in control at that point. And when you start to listen, you know, you must write and you have to write now because you can't put it on hold because you've been putting things on hold or ignoring it for so long. And anybody in our listening audience that aren't listening to these whispers that come across the screen of your brain or your consciousness and think that you can capture them later, usually they're gone when you try and recap that. And it's your your guide who is wanting to guide you in the right way that you should be going and to keep you from harm, keep you from harm's way. So I really think that these indications that we get, that we really need to give them our full focus, no matter what is going on. Well, of course, not when you're driving a car and things like that, but you could repeat them until you had the opportunity to write them down before they're lost in the fabric of time, right? And I think that, you know, you've given us some really good lessons here today to people who might be moving too quickly in their life and needed to hear the words that you've spoken about what ha- what you were doing beforehand, what ended up happening, and then you were stopped in your tracks because you had to listen. And now it's the bountiful of gifts from the universe is coming through you in order to help other people. So I really appreciate that, Jan, and I appreciate you. Do you have anything that you'd like to talk about before I wrap up the show? Well, really quick, some of my most divine um, inspiration has come while I was driving and I had to pull over to the side of the road and write it down. (laughs) Oh, yes, yes, that happens. Yes. And really great songwriters have had to do the same thing. And they know they have to capture it at that point. You know, you have to capture that song. The big thing, though, is to never give up. Mm -hmm. Never put yourself last. I didn't realize until the end of last year how important it is to love yourself. Mm -hmm. And self-care is so important because if you can't love yourself, you can care for others, but not on the deep soul level that you can once you love yourself. Well, and I think that people who do love themselves have a light that's shining in them that others are attracted to and know that they that person can help them you know and i think that that's a that's a real gift when that happens Mm -hmm. thank you so much for being on the show it's such a pleasure that i've met you spent some time with you and and keep doing what you're doing jan because we can change one life every time we speak with them thank you so much for being on the show thank you for having me rhonda thank you for listening theme song for Courting Your Soul is Sun on the Water, composed and performed by John Park Wheeler.